I am Nana Faraika. The time has come for the lioness to tell her story from her viewpoint and tell the world who Queen Omega is. This is the lion's voice. The time has come for the lioness to tell her own story. <laughs> <laughs> Lion voice, tell them that's the people first choice. Lion voice, make the lion let them feel nice. Lion voice, with the lion cubs we sacrifice. Lion voice, got to show the people them the life. Lion voice. Well, I did still say the first of the Almighty. And this is the chance match quasi. And the mission, that's the restoration of the black family. Bless me, say no one curse. Black woman, it's time to merge. Black redemption, we're on the verge. Well, well I don't care what you heard. I listen, I see first, him no second or third. Cause even when their lines are blurred, the eyes stand straight, no bend, no curve. And him give you the love you deserve Him don't come fi dominate, him come fi serve Showed us the way home, I live his words But I can do it alone, so black woman let's merge High tal, sip and herbs we merge Massage fi calm her nurse we merge Together all demon purge we merge Another family emerge we merge We spoke and no speech was slurred We merge we agreed that Babylon's absurd We merge we had pain no, we feel cured, we merge, heal the king, no, she conquered Well, I don't care what you heard Haile Selassie first, him no second or third Cause even when their lines are blurred The eyes stand straight, no bend, no curve Greetings in that divine name of his imperial majesty, Emperor Haile Selassie the first Glory and honor in the name of his chosen queen, Empress Wazero Menin. My name is Kwasi Bonsu, a.k.a. the Chasmach Kwasi, a.k.a. Ras Kwasi, a.k.a. the Reading Ras, a.k.a. the Pan-African Happy Man. I'm a creative industry attorney. I'm an author. I'm an artist. I'm an actionist. And right now, I am the host of Lion Talk Live. Welcome to the Lion Voice Network and welcome to Lion Talk Live. We have a very special program tonight. We are celebrating the earth strong of the Queen of Queens, Walata Georgis, Empress Menin, Empress Wazero Menin. Yes, it's a great joy all over the world all over social media the queen of queens is getting her due we're gonna get deep into the life of the queen of queens tonight we have our second panel ever on the platform uh and this is gonna be a royal panel i'm so elated to bring this panel to the family um i know that this one is gonna be viewed through the four corners of creation and we are happy because we want to educate, enlighten, and also entertain uh, everyone out there in the Rastafari Pan-African family. So uh, before we get into that, I just want to take time and big up the Lion Pride, the Lion Pride on Patreon. Um, big up yourself. If you subscribe, you're part of the Lion Pride. We're building a movement here. Um, I have to big up. Uh, and particularly our Lion Pride on Patreon, those who are, you know, 5, 10, 25, 45, whatever they can afford a month, they're investing in Rastafari independent media. Um, the item are seeing what's happening. You saw that Israel bombed the Iranian consulate in Syria, an act of war. Um, I've been talking about World War III on this platform for some time. It's just now you start seeing the headlines in the mainstream media. I'm a Gideon. We've been saying it from them time. They're chanting it. All of these things. It's happening. 
So more than ever, we need our own independent media uh, to create our own narrative, to hear from the frontline workers, uh, not the propaganda, not the mix-up. We want to see Rastafari highlighted in that highlightful light, and we're doing it here on the Lion Voice Network. So again, I just want to big up everyone, and I know because some people have come in the picture and they've uh, fallen off. It's rough. So... You know, I, I have an attitude of gratitude. If you come for a month and I never see the eye again, we still give thanks. We are, again, uh, just getting started here. Uh, we want to put bring news program, animation, movies, all kind of Rastafari-centric programming. Uh, so we are just getting the housekeeping out of the way, family. I have my guests ready uh, to come forward with their word sound. So I want the Lion Pride, the Lion Pride on Patreon, the whole family to just help I to welcome this esteemed panel. Um, bring forward the panel, Lion Voice, and, and see the lionesses. Tonight we are highlighting the word sound of our lionesses, the African village manifesting. Yes, looking forward. Um, we are looking forward, um, bring them forward, please. Yes, Aile, 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 look at that, the daughters of Zion, Aile. So family, this is a joy for I and I because I respect these sisters so much and I'm so honored that they have come on this platform this evening to have this reasoning with me and, and the family uh, tonight. So I'm just gonna ask each of the item uh, for the Lion Voice, uh, Lion Pride, you, the, the two sisters on the bottom, you know, they are regulars. They're here, you know, uh, we've <laughs> built that energy. So I'm gonna allow, you know, our first time uh, presenter, Dr. Asantua Okupong, Wadi, please introduce yourself and just give the uh, background there. Yes, I give thanks uh, to Jasmine Chikoisi. It's so um, such a blessing to be on this platform and um, to be with your audience this evening. Blessed Earth Strong of Her Majesty, I am Asantua Apangwadiye, um, local to Chicago and um, the founder of um, Empress Menende Chicago here in the city. This year, we're, we're having our eighth uh, annual uh, celebration recognition of Empress Menende's Earth Strong in this city. Um, my daytime job is uh, as a historian. Um, I teach uh, history on the college level at a, a local university here in the city of Chicago. And um, beyond that, my work is really in community, um, serving as um, founder also of Indigo Nation Homeschool Association, a homeschooling group specific to the needs of African-American families on the homeschooling journey. And then ABBA Education Consultant, uh, where we work with schools, universities, community centers to bring content into the classroom that is relevant to us as Black Black people. So that's really been my, um, you know, two handfuls, my job uh, for the past 20 years or so, um, was just making sure that um, our community has what we need. There's um, no place or space that we won't go to research and get the information that our community needs for growth. So give thanks for the opportunity to share. I'm, I'm just, it's such a blessing. I want to greet the entire panel. It's so um, beautiful. Yes, and I must say something about Empress uh, Menin's Chronicles that really grew out of the demand of the people who came in the city of Chicago saying like, once a year is really not enough a science. Well, we need to learn about the Empress much more completely. And it was just trying to meet that demand um, that really forced, it wasn't to, um, you know, on my trajectory to um, create Empress Man and Chronicles, but um, it was created to give um, people something they could take home and, and go deeper with the Empress. Do I think people need a better relationship with Empress Man? Absolutely. Absolutely. I think we only serve to gain the more we know about her. Everyone uh, across um, even like racial lines, but I'm really speaking here of, you know what I'm saying, different religions, uh, different faith traditions, everyone, 
everyone will will learn, will grow from their relationship with her. Mighty, mighty, mighty. Give thanks, give thanks. And I, uh, we're just going to ask that to mute your mic um, in between so we keep down the, the, the feed forward. Um, Rasses, Dr. Walete, can you please introduce the I self? Yes, I. Greetings and blessings. Global Rastafari family. Greetings and blessings, Dr. Santiwa Pongwadie. Greetings and blessings, Rasses, Dr. Jizanai Kush, and give thanks, Dijaz Kwasi. Give thanks for the opportunity to talk with the audience, Lion Pride, about Ionai's mother in elaboration of her earth light. I am Dr. Waletti Beresford. Most of the eyes know I. I am a librarian, researcher by trade. I live in the DMV, Baltimore, uh, Washington area. I'm currently the chairperson of the Universal Development of Rastafari, IDOR. And I am the founder and the owner of a Pan-African bookstore and cultural items store in Baltimore called Yashimabet Books and Things. So I give thanks for the opportunity to be here, this light to reason with the eyes. So give thanks. Give thanks for the mighty work that the eye is doing, Dijazmach Kwasi. It is indeed laudable. Give thanks. Give thanks. And, and I want to publicly thank the I, uh, Rasses Dr. Wallete, because anytime I feel like I need to rest, you know, Dr. Wallete, with the encouragement, you know what I mean? It really means a lot. She's a member of our Lion Pride on Patreon. So it's not just talk. She really uh, sees the vision and, and has really supported I as a brethren in every aspect. So I just want to salute the eye um you know in in person now we have uh rasses dr jazanai kush coming from south florida we had the roots and reasoning uh one of my favorite outings right now may i tell you uh and she's been doing a monthly event so much powerful works please just introduce the yourself um to the family greetings rastafari I am Rasses Dr. Jazanai Kush. I am the CEO and founder of Lalabella Institute, uh, which is an institute that focuses on culturally responsive education uh, for the Rastafari community and for the Black community at large. I'm also the co founder and the former educational director for the Haile Selassie First Learning Center here in Miami, uh, which we founded uh, about, maybe about 17 years ago, if not longer. Um, I'm also the author of Roaring Lionesses, Rastafari Woman, Journeys of Self-Liberation. I'm the author of Blue Fire, The Ascension of the Jaiis and Rastafari, and my most recent work, which is my first fiction work, is called Between the Fire and the Ice. I am also the founder of the Empress Men and Aspa Blue Fire Leadership I Treat, which is an I Treat for Rastafari women. Um, this is our fifth one we just had last strong. And as a matter of fact, I am also the founder of Zipporah, which is a um, priestess, an organization focusing on priestesses and prophetesses in Rastafari. Um, is there any, um, I think I'm missing one more thing. <laughs> um, <laughs> this is, this is um, why I love the family because we're all doing so many works. Mm -hmm. Yes, so, right. So, right. So, the order, the DI block yes, on the order. Good things. I'm also the founder of the first Rastafari Woman's Order, which is akin to a sorority, which is the Blue Fire Order of Empress Men and Aspa. And I'm so very proud to say that we had our first line who ascended to the title of Rastas. 
um, ones might know that I carry that title, but I'm not the only one now. Um, there are three sistren who were who rose, who ascended to the ranks of Rasses, and that stands for Royal Ethiopian. That's with an A. Sistren's exemplifying stately strength. And so I want to congratulate those royal Rasses, uh, Mama Waleti, Mama Thea, and Mama Karima. So yes, I, Rastafari. Yeah, I, I want to do a whole separate reasoning on that topic. Sure and, you, and you do. Sure you do. <laughs> <laughs> because Rasmin had, you know, I mean, we're, we're going to touch, touch no, that. I These know. are my sisters and my family. We're going to get into them. But tonight, we are here for the royal queen of queens, you know, to really. It's just um, <laughs> I, I pray thee. I would be remiss if I didn't take this opportunity. The I say rest mean head. Mm -hmm. Rest us means head wrap. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. This is why we will have to reason. Because we want some clarity oh, on it. But um, I love the fact that the, the family is coming together, organized and centralized more than anything to I is um, important because as I said earlier, we're in serious times. You know, Alma Gideon is real out there and it's not a play thing. So, you know, any um, ones that are coming together right now to, to, to do positive work, Iman is not going to be an obstacle in any way, shape, or form. So I want to start this reasoning, though, with a question. And the format that we're going to use, we're going to just reason. I'll put out questions. I ask these sisters to come forward because each has a particular area of expertise. So you know, feel free to jump in. Where if you don't, you know, if that's not your area, feel free to just hold firm. Um, we're also going to open the comment section to questions. We want this to be a community. So put your uh, comment in the in the chat uh, so that we can, you know, we can make this a, a gathering. This is global. We want to use the technology um, in a way that's constructive. We know that Babylon is using it for a destructive purpose, but now the Rastafari family can come together and we can reason and enlighten each other about the queen of all queens. So the first question is, who is Empress Menin? Who is Empress Menin? Uh, and, I, and I open the floor, so feel free, um, you know, to, to get us started. <laughs> yes, I. Well... Empress Menon is the Ivine Consort of Katamawi, Haile Selassie I. Uh, she is the Negist of Negis. Uh, for I and I, as Rastafari woman, she is the role model. She is I and I role model. Um, however, I and I see her also as a symbol of Kushite divinity. You understand? So when I and I see Empress Menon, I and I don't just see her as the woman who woman affected in this time. I and I see her as healing from an ancient bloodline. And as a result of that, when I and I honor her, we're honoring all of the African queens, especially from their Kushite line, who have stood firm and who have helped to create I and I, I vine matriarchy. I, yes, I, I just want to add to that reasoning, you know, that she is, and here I'm going to lean a little bit on my historical background. She is um, the leading without competition and um, without um, companion on the level that she achieved while uh, on her earth trot of the 20th century, the leading woman on the planet of the 20th century. And I know that that can be argued back and forth, but um, for me, it is sealed. Uh, her works, her um, contribution to humanity, her outreach sealed that, right? And um, I think that the more we look at the details of what her Earth's pride was like, it, 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 it becomes unquestionable who she is. She manifested in our time as we see from 
ancient Kemet, ancient Kush that was already mentioned uh, as Aspet, this foremost woman coming um, and um, really ushering in, protecting uh, the throne um, that played such a pivotal role in the lives of the people in the 20, 21st century, 22nd, 23rd, right? So um, someone had to mother that process and that was her. Give thanks, give thanks. Um, any other song? Dr. Oleti, Rasses, Oleti? Uh, um, so, yes. So the Cistrans blocked uh, Hyla and, and True Sounds of the Empress, and I second, third, and fourth those sounds. Um, I would like to add a small piece. I wasn't sure if there was going to be an opportunity later in the reasoning to block it, but she is also the land empress and the owner of so many lands in Ethiopia. Uh, when I and I trod to Ethiopia in uh, 2019, I believe it might have been about five years ago, uh, I and I had an opportunity to seat up at the uh, archives. Uh, the, net, the full name escapes, I don't know if Asantiwa can chime in, but the, uh, and I seated up at the archives mm -hmm. and was able to gain access to the, uh, not the deeds for the property, but the taxes that ones and ones were paying for that property. Uh, I and I have images of her seal um, the seal that bears her crown, another variation of her seal that includes a heart, uh, the tax ledgers, the ledgers from the payments, just hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of pages. And overstanding that she is the daughter of the Jantira of Ambasal, Jantira Asfa. Yes. John Tira is the oldest title of nobility in Ethiopia. Hmm. It is the most ancient title. Yes. And that is the line that Empress Menon comes from. And the John Tira is the holder of the mountain fortress of Ambasal. Highly, highly. Yes. So when I and I saw the records for the land, um it, it was it was unimaginable the amount of land that Empress Menin inherited as the daughter of the family ruling that Jantu, that uh Ambassal region, the entire mountain fortress. And I read in my research that at some point at different times the Jantira would not only be responsible for the mountain fortress of Ambasal, but it would extend into other regions. So mm. this was like a, an amazing, a broad reach, right? So many of those lands as the gold bead of the family, the gold bead of Negus Mikael, she was, she inherited these lands. So she came to the marriage, and I know I and I will go further into it. I just wanted to touch on that. When the who I'm is she? she no, is the no, of land. So, yeah. Because I, I, I want to take this conversation. Who is this little princess that grows up in this palace? The granddaughter of King Mikael, the hero from the Battle of Adawa. I want to take her down to you know so we can tell the story because I think her story is epic. It look, you know, you know, I I look at it as, as like almost an epic fantasy story, you know. Um, but it starts with some heavy responsibility and most likely some sadness because we have a young girl who, you know, the the the, the burdens of being nobility. And I think when we say nobility, sometimes we just use it casually. But as you say, that comes with land, title, you know, um, millions and millions of dollars of equity. Um, you know, people to take care of aunt who inhabit these lands because before His Majesty rose the Ethiopian from peasants to citizens, 
there, there was no ownership of land. You 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 lived at the behest of these massive land owners who controlled the kingdoms. So who is this little girl? Um, let's speak to Empress Menin, the responsibilities, child marriage. Um, before she has any agency, her family is already making political alliances based on her station. So, you know, let's talk about that. And just I'm opening it up to anyone to jump in. Well, let me say um, that it's often and probably not the fault of the people who have read her biography, um, but more so um, the tone of the translation um, of her, the official biography that is put out at the request of his majesty um, at the end of her earth trot. Um, you know, this is then changed from um, Amharic into English with footnotes. Um, you know, um, we know her as a uh, sister or Miss Angela um, Parnell will put her own footnotes and in, in doing that, create a tone. And so um, I think it was um, um, Sonia Sanchez, known here in the United States as a poet, one of the first teachers of Black Studies. She said, you know, I hope that there is no occasion where white folks have an opportunity to tell the story of my life. Hmm. Um, and she said, I like, I just want to clarify while I'm still here that I don't want that. Mm. And there are reasons for that. Because if you set a tone of sadness, like, oh my God, look what happened to her. Mm -hmm. You know, um, this is the what the reader walks away with. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? So I, I don't see it as a miss. I don't see um tragedy um in the way she was born into royalty and received a royal education. So it's very important to say that Empress Menon was born into a royal family, right? And was expected to carry out the duties of royalty. Amongst those things were being able to read and write on a proficient level so that you could one, handle all of the wealth and the responsibility that came with being royalty. So she was homeschooled like other royal children, right? She was, um, you know, schooled in the language of the church also. So she also read Gez. So um, I'm saying that if we right away, you know, begin to use our American lens or Western European lens and begin to say, oh my God, at 11, she was um, given into child marriage. I mean, it's, I am sure as Empress Menon has said herself, um, this is not something I would repeat. You know, she tells um, Sylvia Pankhurst this. I don't want anyone here married, she said, before the age of 18. She gives that number. So I'm sure that this wasn't the grandest thing about her life. But it's also not wrapped in sadness. You know, this made for a sturdy woman. Okay. For like a strong that. woman. I like that sound. I like that sound. And this is why, um, family, you can see the caliber of the, the panel. Online voice, we don't do nothing surface around here. You know what I mean? We are here to really dig deep into the core of, of this trad and really highlight and have the reasonings um, so that we are we are equipped and we are empowered as we walk through this Alma Gideon. Um, does anyone else want to, to block any other sound on that topic? Yes, I, yes, Con concerning the, uh, the child marriages. Uh, you know, usually when I and I read of, of those traditions, it's usually followed by the statement, as was the custom, as was the tradition. Um, yes, indeed, I and I cannot look upon traditions and customs with a pitiful eye. I and I must, must acknowledge that that was the order of the day until it wasn't. You see? So even those that were uh, participants or those uh, within the space, uh, you know, they didn't see it as such. It is a custom. It is a tradition. Um, that that's just what was at that time, you know. And um, you know, the glory, um, the glory for I is 
the the finale, you know, where where Empress Menon weds the Rastafari Jah or the God, you know. So yeah, so it was all worth it, you know. So and I said, uh, and and that's where we're gonna take the reasoning um, is that that meeting uh, because we also uh, this comes from you know interaction King Mikael. Uh, being the the king of Wolo, and before I go there, did you, I want to block anything on that topic before we move on? Um, Rasses, Doctor Jazanai. Okay, give thanks. So, yeah. So, in terms of the the, the meeting now, the young uh, Dichas match at the time, Tofarai. Uh, he is, you know, by all estimations, already a legend. Um, because in that uh, society, the word travels quickly. Um, he's wearing out his teachers because he wants to learn. He's, he's you know, seeking out knowledge from every corner, every elder, uh, you know, and Lijayasu, uh, Nigos Mikael are watching and want to make sure that he can be trusted because in those days, you know, there were wars for the throne. You know what I mean? Um, it wasn't a stable transition of power, and rarely did you have transitions of power from father to son. Um, you know, the, the kingdoms were, were, were vying for power. Tiedro's son did not get to sit on the throne. Uh, Emperor Johannes' son did not get to sit on the throne. You know, Menelik um, offspring did not sit on the throne. So it wasn't a, a, a stable chart. Everybody's watching everyone. Uh, Talk about the meeting and the union um, of the son of Ras Makonen, who from the age of 13 basically had to raise himself, um, and Princess was zero Menen. Floor is open. Yes, I. Um, I like to talk about this particular meeting a lot in my reasonings and lectures. Um, and I mostly look at it from a um, astrological perspective. Um, I do a reasoning on the lion and the ram, looking at Haile Selassie I as the Leo and Empress Menen Asfa as the Aries. And having looked at the two charts or just even looked at, looking at the compatibility of these zodiac signs, you know that there's no greater match um, then for each other than those two, um, and they're two fire signs, by the way, you know, um, you look at the Aries possessing leadership qualities, uh, very loyal, you know, very headstrong, which is something that a lot of ones, um, I think we, when, when, uh, Rastafari people, for the most part, when we were, introduced to Empress Menon, especially in the earlier years, we were told that she was very, um, you know, she was always referred to as humble and um, just kind of meek, which is really the antithesis of the Aries energy. Um, and, and then with the Leo, you know, being royal, being the king of the jungle, you know, and so you think about these two energies merging and I even go a little deeper and I reference, um, you know, the deities, what these particular deities are represented in ancient Kush. For example, um, you have the Leo or the lion represented by the, the deity of Petamek, and then you have the uh, deity Amun or Amon uh, represented by the ram. So you even see these, these same Kushite uh, deities represented in ancient times, and then we see them coming together. Now, some people may say, well, they're both male deities, but I will caution ones not to get folk, not to get hung up on the gender, but it is energies that we're focused on because even though a moon is considered a male deity, the energy is that of a nurturer. You see, so if you if you take away the gender, which we know that's where everything is headed in this dispensation, is not so much about gender but energies, then you can see how even in ancient times 
we had the pairing of these two um these two energies and so i often think about um a very young menin having gone through what she has gone through in her life uh the divorces uh the death of a husband and i think about a very young energetic tafari right who has now uh, been given the governorship of harar and he says very specifically in his autobiography that he only seeks a wife after having had that governorship for at least a year after things haven't been stabilized there are no upheavals happening and then he knows the next step is to seek uh, a queen or a wife at this time so i i see her being uh very thoughtful and introspective uh, about her life and i see her i can almost envision it her meeting um tafari and knowing the potential that he has and having had these other marriages that did not work for whatever reason uh, and much older than her and then you have this young vibrant um very astute and very focused uh, young man and she decides yes i will i will choose him because even though uh we are told that it was possibly a um and which i believe that it was an arranged marriage there's something about choosing when a woman chooses and i feel very much that she chose and the reason i can say that is because Haile selassie himself points out that her allegiance was to him as opposed to her family which you know they definitely needed somebody on the throne if it wasn't going to be lejasu it would it, it could be menin so Nigas mikael had like a win-win situation happening here but even with that um he makes a a concerted effort you have to be very astute at analyzing what Heidi Selassie says about Empress Menon. It's not a lot, but what he does say is very powerful, that her allegiance was to him. So, um, uh, you know, alluding to the fact that she chose. And I think that, that was, that's what made their union so powerful was because they both had a part in their destiny, the destiny that would become, right, the, the, um, the beauty for the Rastafari nation, you know, for I and I to see that Jai and Jai is coming together. So I don't want to talk off all the talk because I know Asante Y and Waleti definitely have. No, I love, I love it. I love it. This is a, this is heaven for I. Any other songs um, that the I didn't want to block on that love story? Yeah, you know, um, I would just add. I'm sorry. So let go go forward, Doctor Waleti. It was just two seconds. Two seconds. I pray thee. I was just going to say that, um, and I, you know, I, I double checked today. I was just going to say that with the um, Jasmach Amdi Ali Abadeas, the first husband, this is the one that she was divorced from, and Jantira, um, I'm sorry, and uh, no, the first was the uh, Jasmach Ali Mohammed of Cherecha. And the second was Dijazmach Amdi Ali Abadeas. And of course, we know that the popular third was Rasli Ul Sagad Atnaf Sagad. I wanted to say that after having three arranged marriages, two prominent noblemen from Wolo and one prominent from Shua, I think by the fourth, and of course, she was the apple of uh, Negus Mikael's eye. She totally was the gold bead. And I'm sure by the fourth, she was able to say, grandfather, you know, take away Leul Sagad Atnaf Sagad and give on to I Tafari. I want Tafari. I want to choose. You've chosen for me. You've I chosen mean. and you've chosen and you've chosen. May I now choose, I grandfather, mean. please. I and mean. grandfather said, yes. <laughs> you can, go. You can mean. choose. I mean. Because, yes, yeah, sir. because it said in the history that she, it said in the history that she, I mean, that Lija Yasu and, and Nigos Mika, they noticed the chemistry. So obviously reasoning and, and interaction was taking place and they thought it would be advantageous. Um, Dr. Asantewa, the floor is for the eye. 
Yeah, I, I think right along those same reasonings as uh, everyone has said, um, this was a strategic thing that Lijiasu thought he was doing in um, arranging um, their meeting. Um, but immediately upon the first meet, if we follow the lines of her biography, um, in both of them, which both of them are narrated or, or written by the same person, um, Yared Michael, um, even though they've been translated by other people, he's the original author. Um, it is said immediately um, they notice as a couple and the people around them notice. And so, um, Liz Yasu saw like, oh, we could use this, right? Let's get him, let's, um, him and her, let's get them in Harar, far away from the capital, you know, and um, essentially um, nullify that threat to the throne that he might come, you know, because people already saw the growing um, um, presence and power um, in, you know, did as much. Um, um, and they saw it coming. They they could see it and sense it. So he wanted that threat far away, and he thought he had taken care of that problem. Uh, but uh, as he's thrown off the throne, um, and his father um, Ras Mikael, who become King Mikael of Wolo, uh, decides that wait a minute, um, I'm not going to sit down for this. For um, you know. Um, his grandfather's throne to be taken from him. I'm going to rush. I mean, for me, it indicates that the Wallow um, kingdom and soldiers were strong enough to take on the national, um, you know, soldiers and to essentially wage war against the nation. Ian uh, Chen, remember that the Wallow Calvary is the legendary Calvary, you know, you don't ramp with Wallow, Wallow horseman then. Right. These are, you know what I mean? These are the top Aromo Calvary in the land. They they ride sideways upon them horse. Them can do everything where you, where, you, where you want to do. And as you said, you know, the this is when the, the Rasses and the Kings, they had independent armies. The armies were not loyal to the central government. Right. These kingdoms paid tribute. To the central government, but other than that, they ran their kingdoms autonomously. They had the Menelik and these other rulers had no say in Wallow. It's Ras Michael or King uh, Nigos Mikhail who run Wallow. So, this is one of the epic battles in the yeah. history when the kingdom of Wallow marches on Addis Ababa. Yes, and, and they approach Empress Menon, who is then pregnant, and say, say, say to her, like. First of all, the counselors told um, then Rastafari that you know you can't uh, wage war against somebody's grandfather. And you're with his granddaughter, you know, um, you know what I'm saying. Put her aside, and so he chose in that moment, saying, "No, I'm not doing that." And then when she, uh, Empress Menon, um, who was then Princess Menon, is approached um, with the same proposal, like, you know what? Get rid of this man. We we you, we get you another husband. You done been through enough. She chose. She says no. And even under the threat, if we are to believe some of what is written in the biography and the interpretation that is added there, and I've been told by members of the family that that interpretation is not entirely true, only partially true. Um, but if we are to believe what is written there, um, you know, she was threatened to be put out of um, the crown land. And she said, you know, just let me have this child and I, I'm going to go find my husband. I'm fine, <laughs> you know. And so a very brave move from a very vulnerable woman to turn on the will of her family. And also uh, for, you know, then Rastafari to turn on the will of his counselors. Yeah. Like, listen, sh she's the one. I said she's the one. And she said he's the one. So they found each other. They found something really beautiful and divine that is still resonating. And this is a symbol of Ethiopian unity because she was not from Shawa. He is not from Wolo, but yet still the love conquered, you know, and, and really um, changed, would change the face of this ancient empire, you know, bringing it into modernity. So I really um, love this. Uh, if you have any comments, family, please uh, put the comments in the comment section. We have an esteemed panel tonight. Um, I'm the only person who don't have the doctor. I mean, I tell you, everyone here is well. Actually, I'm a jurist doctor, so I take it forward. I'll be your doctor up here. 
family we are giving the deep analysis you know this is not a surface reasoning if you have not subscribed to the platform please subscribe to the platform uh we are building a movement all right so um this love you know um and uh, uh, we also have to mention that there was no guarantee at this time that Haile Selassie would sit on the throne. You know, so this was not a sure deal um, when they're making these decisions. There's no guarantee that uh, the, the the army in, in Addis Ababa was going to beat Wolo, the kingdom of Wolo. You know what I mean? So uh, this is not, uh, this is an act of fate. Uh, and uh, talk about uh, what happens after this epic um, battle? Well, I will add here that this is where um, member, the current living members of uh, the royal family have said that there's a lot of untruth. Empress Menon's biography said that um, His Majesty having defeated Ras Mikhail takes him into custody. And um, he does that by sending monks who, um, you know, ask him to, you know, just please surrender. We don't want this to be terrible. And um, that um, Negus Mikhail, you know, uh, you know, decides to, you know, imprison the monks. Um, they have flatly refused that and like asked me to like, do not repeat that. Th that's a lie. So we still are figuring out what happened, how, um, Ras Mikhail, who will become Negus, um, actually um, surrenders, how that surrender happens. But we do know that it does happen, right? And that um, then we have a pretty much consistent government for a little while um, with Empress Zwati II and her plenty potentiate, um, you know, um, you know uh, Rastafari, who will become Negus. Um, and will be her spokesperson internationally. And for me, um, I listened in a lot of Rastafari circles before I heard and before I researched and read that every time His Majesty was crowned, when he was given prince, Empress Menon was given princess. When he was given king, Empress Menon was given queen. When he was given emperor, she was given empress. So they are both triple crowned. Ooh. A triple crown does not belong only to his majesty. Okay. She's also a triple crown. Okay. We're going there, family. We're going there, family. This is exclusive because I know most of us were not aware of this information. So uh, I love that. Um, so the let, let's talk about the crowning, you know, because this is when you come into Rastafari, at least my generation, you know, this was something that we heard about you know, king and queen crowned same time. Uh, he broke with the tradition. His majesty writes about it. You know, he doesn't write much about Empress Menon through the autobiography, but he takes the time to say that he had to reason, you know, with the priests and the elders and make special provision um, to, to change a long-standing tradition. And for those who know about ancient societies, changing a tradition is not something you just do willy-nilly. It's not, so, you know... It, and it, and it speaks to how verse you know his majesty was in terms of the the is the, the the you know because he has to make an argument as to why at this time you know uh it's going to change and he can't just unilaterally do that without creating corruption or up you know uh disunity in the church so he has to do it diplomatically as he always does but let us talk about the crowning of Empress Menin and, and what that represents, this triple crown. I'm opening the floor. Yes, I, I always cite the crowning of uh, Empress Menin from a very esoteric um, space. Uh, I see Empress Menin, you know how, how Haile Selassie talks about Empress Menin being um, like unto Sarah, right? Yes. Yes. Um, I see Empress Menon in the capacity of mother, sister, and wife. Okay. And so what that means in the ancient Kushite traditions, if you know anything about the coronations of the, the Kushite kings, the mothers had to be there. There was really no coronation without the mother. You understand? And Haile Selassie 
having lost his mother at such an early age. Um, Empress Menon fulfilled that role also, just in her nurturing. You understand? Just uh, he he speaks about her being his advisor. So she definitely serves that a multiplicity of roles in his life. So when I think about um, having the ancient Kushite pharaoh's crown and how the, the mother must be a part of that procession because it's, it's null and void. It doesn't even happen. So having her crowned alongside him to I, and this is just I going into I heavens, is really just a reenactment of that Kushite mother being a part of that whole coronation scene. But in this case, she is crowned alongside him as his Ivine consort. Um, I also see Empress Menon, and I know later on someone might, or, or the I might talk about her relinquishing this crown, right? And I cite that the crown, of course, the crown means something. So I don't want to say that it didn't mean anything, but I, I want to say that her role as Jaes supersedes to I that of Empress. So because she is mother, she is Jaes, she is sister, she is Empress, she possesses so many roles, you understand, to really get caught up in her having one. I think is 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 a is not a very wise thing, you know. When we look at her, we must look at her in her totality. But also, we must understand that if we had to trump anything, that role of Jaes, you understand that role of Iritical Negis, which is what I talk about in my first book. That is her role. So the giving up of that crown, people look at it and they say, "Oh, what a wonderful thing!" You know, what a what a virtuous thing, what a you know, all, all of these wonderful um, synonyms. But I, I, I cite she had done her, her, her job because when she chanted in Jerusalem, you understand, for the victory to be, that was her ultimate role. And that was that of Jaes. So Empress, yes, it's a wonderful title. And Haile Selassie I um, brought forward that ancient Kushite tradition when he had her crown. She had to be involved. Give thanks, give thanks. Um, floor is open. Yes, I and recess. I wanted to block a sound uh, regarding her crown. And though she gave up that sound, that crown, and indeed Jaes Trump's Empress, she used her crown as a symbol on her. Uh, let me see if I'm able to share it. I pray thee on her seal in the IC. Um, um, it's very light. Bring it a little closer, bring it closer, closer. Okay. Yeah. Okay, yes, yes. That's uh, that's the I cited. Yes, so sir. Th this goes forward to the sound of the triple crowning, also representing Empress Menin, because this is her crown. This is not the crown of Katamawi. Yes. This is her crown on her symbol there, and also her crown once more. Ah, let me see how good. Yes, yes. Yeah, I cite it. Yes, I Right, and these are the seals that appeared. It's not the only uh, seal that appeared on the documents for her, but definitely this kind of solidified in the irits that indeed these are the Empress Men in Lands. And her seal was crown yeah, land. Crown seal, land. Yeah, the crown land. Yes, I. Yes. And that's her crown. That's the, the, yes. the crown of Empress Men in. Yes. So give thanks. Give thanks. Um, so mighty. So mighty. Yeah. Um, give thanks. You know, I, I really am indebted and I really need to take this moment to thank um, Dr. Valetti um, for even just the idea that we can make it to Ethiopia. Because it wasn't even something I, that, you know, just in the course of my life that I had a plan for. I'd already been to other parts of Africa, but I didn't have a plan for that. 
Um, and I can say that the moment that we were there at National Archives and they said, uh, we have the papers that are from her desk, um, surreal, you know, still, it's just feeling unreal. And then I don't know what I thought they would bring out. I thought maybe a folder or so. Um, they came wheeling a cart, right? <laughs> with reams and reams and reams of paper. Understanding that her crowning, to be crowned an empress is to be given crown lands, as was rightly mentioned, um, but also to be given your own standing army. Yes. And your crown lands because they are now um, occupied possibly by people are, who are paying taxes to you, which is what the bulk of the letters were, you know, um, management of it, you know, have the money's been paid, et cetera. You know, who's moving in, who's moving out, you know, um, but she also has a budget beyond that as an empress, you know what I'm saying? And so if we look at her titles, like I love the chanting of his majesty's titles. Um, and I remember like being so young in this movement, you know, thinking, are they making this up? <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, I started as, you know, like a Rastaman's queen and not like a Rasta queen, you know? Okay. Uh, so I remember okay. like looking at uh, Rasta like, where did they get that from? Who gives them the authority to say that, you know? And he was like, those are his crown titles, right? They're not making that up. And absolutely, that's absolutely true and carries out in the histor historical file. But also her majesty had crown titles and names. Call so them. Cream and all just majesty. That's a, a crowned title, lady of value, a hmm. crowned title. And then this title that, you know, there's fear in representing. Um, and I don't want to try to say it in Amharic, but it translates loosely uh, in English as queen of kings. So I love it when I hear the sister say queen of queens, you know what I'm saying? But that's not her title. Her title is queen of kings. And if we translate that, we transliterate that it's literally the woman king. Hmm. It's literally the woman king. When we look at it, um, I will spell it out here for um, our audience if they can see our notes. Um, it, it literally means the female king or ruler, right? So um, I remember on asking my Amharic source, like, you know, um, translate that. <laughs> And he was like, this title was never given to Empress Menon. Hmm. Very rarely in our history have we seen this title given to anyone at a crowning, right? But then we go through the text when she is specifically being interviewed and she introduces herself as such, Queen of Kings. Hmm. This is Remember very, this is the exclusive people. family. Lion voice alone, y'all gonna hear them reasoning. I mean, yeah. I tell you. And so I, 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 for me, it sealed it, it sealed it, it sealed it. His majesty said that it was decided after consultation okay. that they would um, change this whole process. Possibly, I'm injecting here, this is myself, what yeah. has happened since the, uh, the Ethiopian nation went into Christendom, mm -hmm. um, but Whatever it was, his majesty said, after consultation, I asked, I inquired, I looked inside, I did research, and it was decided that the empress would be crowned on the same day as the emperor in the same place. Remembering that when you read the order of the coronation, the priest does not typically, and uh, according to history, anoint the empress. You know what I'm saying? This is done by the king. The king does that. The emperor does that on the mm -hmm. third day in a different place. So when they went to reach for Empress Menon's crown, the priest first handed it to his majesty, who was just newly crowned. Like, you know, this is really your job. Are you sure? I want you to officially say in front of people mm -hmm. that I should do this. And he said, it is my truthful will that she mm -hmm. should be my glory. It's my truthful will. It's my truthful will. Absolutely. I stand with what um, Dr. Rasses Jasenai Kush has said that he was returning to a tradition that is long standing. Absolutely. Your mother must declare your right 
to the throne at your coronation all along the Nile. All of, we see continuity from top to bottom, from inside Africa right to the borders of the Mediterranean. We see that continuity over hundreds of years. My mother and child. Years. Your mother must declare your right. So with, with his mother not being present, I absolutely stand with that assertion. Empress Menon fulfilled that role. Although yeah. when you, you pour through the coronation order, you don't see where her voice is notated. Um, several people have made efforts to obtain the part of the tape that shows Empress Menon's crowning. No, with no avail. But Very, she very sacred, very sacred moment. Yeah. Um, and, you know, who knows what, what time will reveal. Um, but, yeah, you're correct. We've never seen that those that 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 footage um now empress menin uh, his majesty is very clear though that she did not receive the anointing oil and that you know he was still the head and this was not a co-rulership and uh, this was also um stated in the revised constitution and the initial constitution now how i see that is you know Haile Selassie, Empress Menin to I, they are one flesh. And we'll talk about how she stepped in and assumed certain other duties of government to show that, you know, in terms of competence, you know, she was able to, to, to fill in when his majesty was on the front, the war front. Um, however, um, it was careful. And this is why, uh, you know, because this channel, I have mostly a male viewership, according to the analytics. And I'm really trying to cultivate the Rastafari man to stand up, um, you know, as a head and to and to and to lead, you know, to lead his family, lead his queen. Yes, the, the, the queen is there, um, but I don't want the bridge them to uh, not know their responsibility. Now, I have an esteemed panel here of powerful sisters. I want the item to give I the item sound in terms of why um, Empress Menin did not receive the anointing oil, what is the messaging um, at the coronation because it was a detail that was included in the autobiography. Um, and again, it doesn't say in the constitution that I and Empress Menin are the head of this government and so forth and so on. Well, how the item cite this reasoning, if that? Uh, the, the just much Kwasi, I'm going to backpedal a little bit to the to the sound that was being blocked about her titles. Yes, yes, please. I was I was reading where Empress Menin and His Majesty shared some titles. It says, "This is the crowning," and it says, "The day before Empress Menin received the divine coronation on the same day as the Emperor." She joined him in a night of fasting and constant prayer until the early morning hours as they prepared to take on the mantles or the titles as they prepared to take on the titles such as elect of Jah, elect of Yah, it says, Rose of Sharon, hmm. bright and morning star and the Ali. light of the world. Yeah, so, mm -hmm. Yes. So the way this is written, those are shared titles. They said, as they appeared to take on. So it goes forward to the one flesh, to the melding of the two and becoming one. Relevant to the titles that, that uh, were taken on at St. Georgis Church in Addis Ababa, November 2nd, 1930. Yes. Mighty, mighty. Sorry. And I want to just acknowledge before we go on, we have 33 people on here live. This is a record for our live. I have gratitude, even though the numbers are small. I just want to say we give thanks for the family checking in. Um, put where you're, you're watching from in the comments so we know who's here, who's checking in from the family. We're having a very crucial reasoning on our divine mother, Empress Waziro Menin. Um, this is this is you know something that I think we all benefit from um, as we chart forward into this Armageddon. So um, the floor is open. 
and we're talking about the crowning, the anointing, um, and the balance, you know, in terms of, because this has uh, implications in terms of how I and I governing our Rastafari families as well, because this is the archetype, you know, our, our mother and father provide the archetype in terms of how I and I um, govern our, our, our household. So the floor is open. Yeah, I, I would just um, like to add that that line in His Majesty's biography that says, um, you know, except for the royal anointing, um, which we know were um, seven oils um, that were put on His Majesty, um, that every other part of the coronation, um, Her Majesty and His Majesty um, were together in, except for this royal anointing that designates the current leader and ruler. I don't think anyone, not even Empress Menon, is in um, position or it has the will to say that um, he was not the sovereign ruler of this nation. Um, but we are saying that the, if you look from antiquity coming, these uh, the person out front is indeed out front and designated out as such, but it is the family. We really have royal ruling families. It is the family that really is the governing structure of the nation. So um, I don't see it as tiered where we have like first, second, and he's first and she's second. I don't see it as such. I see it as um, let's present to the world um, the singular person who is responsible for whom everything comes through, right? But it is the whole group. It is not unlike right. any other um, person that comes to power, say in the United States, you know, the singular person receives all of the accolades, but they govern with others. You know what I'm saying? And so that's what we're saying is that she is part of the governing structure. You know what I'm saying? And I have taken hit after hit for saying this, but we, if we, it is clear just from her titles. Um, the history is clear. The history is clear. Empress Menon did govern, you know, so um, give thanks for the passion. Um, Rosa, I'm, we'll let um, yes, I'm, I'm wondering, where were the oils placed? What part of the body was the seven oil anointing for Karamawi? I believe it was on his forehead. It was all seven on the forehead? That's my understanding. Uh, if someone in the comments knows different, Mecca and I reason it up, but that's my understanding. Okay. I, I was really wondering about the Empress not receiving the seven oils and wondering if it had to do with the sacredness of her temple as feminine, as a mm -hmm. woman, where the oils were being placed and did that have something to do with the priests not anointing her in that way? Um, well, yeah, no, I, I, I think he, he ties it to because she did not share in the rulership in terms of the responsibility. Um, and that is why we'll get someone to, to read it. Yeah, I got to look that up because uh, so the oils enabled the ruling and the responsibility. Yeah. Um, pass me the autobiography, Young Tafari. We're gonna we're gonna go into it tonight. I, yeah, yeah, the I, the I have to go into it because you're not going to rule through oils. Well, no, it's, it's 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 no, no. It, this is this is the symbol, and of course we know that Christ is the anointed one. All of these things. I understand. I'm just trying to make sense. Everything else was granted, with the exception of the oils. So there has to be a really, really logical reason why that wasn't done. The praying and the fasting and the sharing of the titles, they were both the Rose of Sharon. They yeah. were both the bright and the morning star. You know, so, right. Um, tradition being changed. Tradition being changed. And let's just not change that piece. So, yeah, I, I have the question. I'm wondering. Part of the reading that I have ready says that the procedure for the enthronement of the empress is today very different from that which is used, that which used to be in um, previously 
According to our historical study, and this is from the biography of His Majesty, according to the, our historical study of earlier practices, the Empress was not anointed with the oil of kingship on the grounds that she did not share in the rulership with the Emperor. The crown being merely symbolic was very small. It was in the palace that the Emperor placed the crown on her head and not in the church. This occurred on the third day, for it was not permitted for her to be crowned on the same day as the emperor. But the text then pivots and says, but now it was determined after consultation and accordingly carried out that except for the regal anointing, the archbishop should place the crown on her and put the diamond ring on her finger and that this should be on the same day jointly with the coronation of the emperor. Um, so not closing out on this idea that she didn't share in rulership. That was a previous idea that was pivoted from. But again, the royal um, anointing did not happen um, for her as it did for him. If any anointing happened, it wasn't recorded. Okay. Um, this, is, this is a good reasoning. I really give thanks. Um, Again, I want anyone in the comments, feel free, ask any questions. We have a lot to, to get through. I don't want to spend all of the time on this, but these are points. And we're going to, over the years, we're going to come forward to these things um, and, and get deeper as we can research, as we learn the Amharic, because we have to do the scholarship in the indigenous language as we go forward to the continent. Um, and... You know, I have to tip my hat to uh, Dr. Walete, Dr. Asantewa, because they, you know, went to Ethiopia. They went and started this, this task that generations are going to be tasked with to really bring these things to the light. So I really want to salute the two of the item. And, uh, you know, this is the highest level reasoning on Empress Men and I personally have ever been in. I don't, I don't know if this happens every day are around the place but i personally am you know having a very idleful time just uh being able to go so deep and having ones whose knowledge is so vast so we really give thanks um i want to get into though the works of empress menin and in terms of um you alluded you know uh proverbs 31 speaks to um, the virtuous woman, she sees a land, she purchases it, she does this, she does that, bum, bum, bum. And you alluded to her governing many lands and having responsibility for the administration of many lands and not just having the land, but, you know, from time to time liquidating these lands to build a church, to build a school, um, you know, so she's managing her finance and uh, you know, one of the unique things that his majesty and her majesty did is that they took their personal wealth and, and invested it into the nation. There's no nobility in Ethiopia's history that gave more of their personal wealth and lands um, as, you know, of course, the highest example would be converting the palace into a university. Um, but talk to us about the works of Empress Menin and the floor is open. Well, I, I and I know that she opened uh, the first uh, school, the all-girls school uh, in Ethiopia. Um, let me get the information to be specific. In Addis Ababa. Um, and it was a very, um, it was a very high school, you know, as it relates to the education that was pre-loved there as it relates to the food that they ate, the way that they were treated and the expectations for the staff. It's, it's almost as if she offered the children or the attendees an education on the level that she received within her royalty. Mm -hmm. um, I thought I had written down some information about it but yes so she definitely opened that school there were orphanages and churches um 
patroness of the Red Cross. Just, I mean, works too numerous to even name and list and to frame up and place in a box. Um, just broad and spanning across all agencies and areas within Ethiopia. I mean, she goes from the tanker that storms the gate to free Haile Selassie to the, the order of the Queen of Sheba, just title upon title upon title upon title, just I and I's perfect example. That is why I and I hail her without apology mm -hmm. and give her all of the glory. She is the example for I and I to follow. Yes, I. Give thanks. Yes, I. Yes, I. Um, you know, when you talk about the works that she did, you know, as her daughters, it's important that not only I and I know these works, but that I and I also emulate these works. And so um, one of the things that she did during the time of the war was, um, you know, mobilize Ethiopian women, um, in particular women of affluence, you understand, to be able to financially uh, support uh, some of these efforts that happened uh, during the war. And so with I and I as the Blue Fire Order of Empress Men and Asfa, we rest on that, that whole uh, service, you understand, that whole service tribe. Um, we know Rastafari in itself is a service tribe, but we definitely um, look for Sistren who I and I know are willing to work under the red, gold, and green umbrella of Empress Menon, but a group of women who are willing to uh, lead as well as uh, support efforts like the advocacy of women's rights, just like Empress Menon Aspa. So those works, we can look at them historically, um, but you know, just looking at them and just being able to um, identify them, but not emulating them, I think um, is an issue. So I'm glad that you brought all of her works up because those works are still going on. Give thanks, give thanks. Um, we have Freeway Dread popping in from Florida. Big up Freeway Dread. We have uh Rastafari family healing from Trinidad, tapping in uh, Roger Gonzalez. We have uh Sister Carrington, uh Blissful Love, all TNT Trinidad I represent tonight. <laughs> yes, family. Yes, uh giving thanks from Jamaica for I and I three illustrious sisters, Queens, Dr. Walate, Wade, and Kush. Yes, give thanks at Sister Aisha and I family, uh, there in JA. Iras, big up yourself. What makes Empress Men in Divine explain the divinity? We're going to get there um, after the work. Um, yes, Empress Men in owns Gaza by right. Yes, there was properties purchased. Uh oh, we touch a button there. We touch a... We're going to go deep, family. Make sure the item stay tuned because uh, Ethiopia owns a lot of land in that region. We're going to talk about it. Um, uh, what teachings would she want ones and ones to pass on to all women, to each one? Give thanks. Uh, big up, big up. Uh, I'm on from Philadelphia. So we have the family uh, tuning in. Uh, we are talking about the works of Empress Menon. If you have not subscribed to the platform, subscribe to the platform. We are unapologetically Rastafari over here at the Lion Voice Network. No apology. We talk about what we want to talk about. We don't have it as a side topic or a footnote. It's the main topic. Rastafari, independent media, family. We are building it in real time. So, um, the works. Let's talk yes. about. Uh, continue. Go ahead. 
I I want to um, talk about the fact that Empress Menon came to the throne with the vision. Um, yes. So I've said it in other public um, speaking events that you know Empress Menon suggested these things, uh, namely a girls' school under um, the leadership of Empress Zwaritu, and she was told no. And she did not let that vision die in her heart because she was told no. She came to the throne um, with it like, okay, when, when it's my turn, I'm going to do it, right? Um, so she opened the school in October of 1930, ahead of the coronation. This is a woman on a mission. I don't want us to think about a rinky-dink um, neighborhood school. And I respect neighborhood schools, right? Um, I don't want us to think about that when we think about Empress Men in School for Girls. And I've heard it chanted up in circles like, you know, she opened the school. No, well, I'm talking about opening a Title IV school. I recently got hold of an article where the government of Ethiopia today is asking any girls who pass the national exam of France while attending Empress Men in School, please turn in those certificates. She had a Title IV school teaching all of the standard classical forms of Western education and Ethiopian education. Hmm. And Ethiopian education. Hmm. And her girls tested with the French, um, which was really the lingua franca at the time, and also the dominant force. Yes, diplomatic, of, diplomatic language was French, French. yes. Yes, so she had them sit for that exam and they sat and passed sat and passed. And although she had to call in foreigners originally to get her school to that level, she said, you must train the teachers here. We don't mm. need you here always, right? Mm. And I've um, had a chance to talk to members of her alumni society who have informed, first of all, her alumni is active here in the United States. It, it's still here. It is not gone. The alumni are still actively supporting the school. They have said that those were some of the first black women to attend Oxford was coming out of Empress Menon School hmm. and Stanford. Hmm. Those were some of the first black women to do that. Okay. Well, we're not talking about a little operation, you know, a six room school. You can see some of the pictures online where she's touring her science lab hmm. and touring her gym. Hmm. Right. We're talking about what the highest standard of education that we call Title IV in the United States, right? And it's a dynamic movement to put women, I mean, drastically shifting. Now, she didn't invite elite women. Why invite elite women? They already have it. They don't actually think their daughters need education because the money is so abundant. She invited, she invited regular working class, what we would call the peasantry, people from that category and class. Imagine the shift. Imagine the shift. The first woman to sit in Ethiopian parliament came through the Empress Menon School, was actually the principal at the Empress Menon School. From peasant to citizen. She, she I mean, a, a, like a seismic shift she's creating with this school. Not only is she doing that, she's taking on disability or um, education for the disabled, for the deaf, for the blind, huh. right? And we need to talk about that in conjunction with the fact that she had adult education, something that really didn't take off in the United States to mid-century, mid-20th um, century, um, where we have like, you're an adult, okay, your children are raised, are you just gonna sit at home and weave, you know, or are you gonna come? And let's um, strengthen you so you can be the backbone of this nation. Wow. She was like, adult women should come. When she first opened that school, that school was empty. No one was signing up. By the time she made her earthly transition, that school had a waiting list. Hmm. You know what I'm saying? So we're talking about somebody revolutionizing education. I'm telling and then you. that piece that I, I, I don't want, the European thing only. Look, you can't lose your ability to create magic for the Ethiopian table. Our delicacy is world known. We, we're not giving that up. I'm creating my own cookbook. So this that this will be remembered quite often. Educated women are actually like, you know, I don't do the domestic things, you know? That's not uncommon here. She wasn't trying to raise those kind of women. Hot, 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 hot. You know, well-rounded women. 
Yeah. And so what did she do with all those lands? She created churches, schools, hospitals, you know, businesses, resources for the, the Ethiopian people. First laundromat, first child care center, right? Everything to make women's lives easier. Mills, putting mills in environments so you don't have to hand grind all your teff, hand grind, you know, take up all your hours so that your mind cannot shift to govern governorship of your area, of your life, of your family, of your nation. We're going to free up some of that time that you got to hand wash everything. I'm going to put facilities here to ease up women's burden uh, on the domestic level so that some of their attention can be brought to the uh, uplifting of this nation. Wow. Yeah. Um, Sister Dr. Aini says she's taking notes. Um, this is this is very valuable, family. I, I you know I'm in heaven um, on earth because we're not be, we're not dealing with sky god. We are here living the the, the vision. You know I, I really give thanks to be here with my sisters. Um, reasoning, Dr. Walete, the I. Yeah, I just want to show the empress with the children and how proud she looks as she smiles at her handiwork. Let me see if I can get it for the eye. Put it closer, 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 closer. <laughs> yes. Yes, give thanks, give thanks. Mighty works. And um, one of the things that we need um is a state-of-the-art rastafari schools we need schools we need co-ed schools girls schools um can you imagine a rastafari version of spellman college you know uh these yeah. kind of finishing school can you imagine a rastafari morehouse or or howard you know um curriculum there's no reason that we can't do it in this time because we have the trained professionals and i want to big up social crew um, I know that there are efforts that are happening, um, but you know this, these kind of reasons just show how important we need our institutions. Um, we have the, uh, the Lollibella Institute. Don't uh, forget, uh, Lollibella I was there. Yes, yes. The Lollibella yes. Institute, Rasas Jazanai's. We're not. We're not going to come off of this this line without talking about Lollibella. That we will seal with. Um, when we leave about the action items, we're going to talk about Blue Fire, I Treat, Lalabella. This is the station that we talk about these things because that's I and I um, institution building. Um, so it really, it really is powerful. Um, let's talk about um, the, the, the time of exile, um, the war period, Empress Menin um, travels to Bath. Um, with His Majesty, this is, uh, and I'm actually reading the autobiography again with my son and my daughter. Um, we're doing a family. Shireen is uh, Mama Shireen is reading with Ya. I'm reading with Tafar, and then we come together and reason on it. And you know, I was just thinking about at this time when, you know, this is the lowest period when we look at the the, the public reign. Um, and His Majesty's forethought to really document his story, tell his own story, you know, and he says that there will be people that will come to write stories that are not true, you know, and at that time there was not a, a whole lot of books on His Majesty in the 1936 when he says it, so it's a prophetic statement that he really um, saying, I'm going to take the time and, and document, uh, and Empress Menin is right there, but because of the weather in England, um, you know, she had to remove herself from that environment and, and spend the time in Jerusalem. Um, any songs that the item want to, to block about that period, because that's the period where, you know, she livocates her crow and all of these things that, you know, um, ones may or may not be familiar with in the history. Um, but I like to assume that not everybody is so versed as we are. Uh, and so I just want to touch on um, the time because we all go through our exile. We all go through our period where we're down in the valley. And I give thanks that our divine parents showed us how to trod. We have an example of how to stay productive at your lowest moment, how to um, work for the benefit of your mission, how not to lose faith um, during these, these, these periods of exile. And also this to I is when they 
had a diaspora experience. So they experienced what I and I in the diaspora, the children who have been exiled, you know, who were exiled, who had to grow up in cold environments and, you know, beat them, uh, you know, uh, 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 you know, see all of these Europeans around you and you're the only uh, black person in the space. His Majesty talk about how they were hiding under tables when he come into the restaurant, trying to hide from him and all these things and how they were dealing with him. The you you know trying to humiliate him. Um, talk about you know Empress Menin at this time because she was just as active as I Majesty in terms of not letting this detractor from her works. Yes, I. I think that during the time of exile um, is where we first began to see. Um, Empress Menon's leadership in like an overdrive. So uh, one spoke about, you know, her schools and these things, and that definitely exhibited leadership. Um, but I think that while she was in exile, I, I identified three areas of leadership. Um, I created a, a Empress Menon Aspa Blue Fire leadership model based on you know, I know that Haile Selassie's leadership is examined uh, for the world. And I also know that many leaders, world leaders, you know, consulted him and emulated his leadership style. But I think that when we talk about Empress Menon, her leadership style um, hasn't really been analyzed. And so I identify three leadership styles. Um, one is her iritical leadership. You know, for ones, you know, that that's her spiritual leadership. So we know that that's exemplified by her um, having the monastery built um, in Jerusalem. Also with her having, you know, the churches, supporting the churches. So we see her leading that way. We also see what I like to call her exigency leadership, which is her emergency leadership. It's her, her leadership in overdrive, okay? Things are getting really hot. Things are getting hectic. What do I do now? How do I lead? You understand? So we see when she shift gears. And then finally, I identify a pillar of her leadership entitled her truths and rights leadership where she's um, advocating for the rights of women, the rights of girls, you understand? And um, it's that iritical leadership with her being in Jerusalem that I think is a really, really powerful piece because we see um, originally, right, uh, some of the, the articles state that she had planned on going to the forefront of the battlefield with Katamawi. You understand? And somehow we see a change there. So we don't see her doing a tie to. We don't see her going to the front lines, you know, literally in battle. But what she does do is she goes to battle iritically. And, and going to the, having that monastery built where she is there with those monks and she is able to hold up, you understand, her part in this war by chanting. You understand by, um, we know that they hail her as the Queen of Sheba return when she forwards to Jerusalem. You know, we see all of the clergy, you know, surrounding her. You understand? So everyone at this point is recognizing her as a spiritual or iritical powerhouse. So I would assert that while His Majesty is on the forefront, you understand, fighting, you know, in the physical realm, you know, showing man, she is on the, and I wouldn't even say behind the scenes, but I would say she's in the other realm, you understand, being able to hold up things from that, that really spiritual source. Mighty, mighty, mighty. Um, Sister Karima said, there is also Priest Isaac Institute of Holistic Knowledge. So big up Priest Isaac definitely have to shout out he's doing some powerful works on his platform as well um but yes um iritical extingency and what was the other one the truth and rights yes so um these are three leadership examples any other songs please family yeah um give thanks for that very um strong reasonings 
I would just like to add that I am in agreement that these years um, of coming up to the invasion and the invasion itself, we really get to see Empress Manning come into her own. Um, now, we know that on the eve of the war, she gives on September 11th, um, which may not be also September 11th in Ethiopia, but for when the when the sound comes to the United States and outside of um, you know Ethiopia, it is September 11th, and I don't think that that date is coincidental. Um, she gives this sound where she says, you know, um, countries are coming to take over my country under the fallacious pretext of civilization. Hmm. So you know. His Majesty is extremely diplomatic, and you really just got to admire um, the way he handles um, his known enemies in public. But Empress Menon um, is what I call machete tongued. <laughs> you know, this sister is out there cutting and blazing. May God help us. May God save us from such, such civilization. Hmm. Uh, I'm, it's clear, like you, you're not fooling anybody. We know what you're really doing. Right. And we know that once Emperor, um, the emperor is tied to the battlefield in 1936, Empress Menon is complete head of state. She is doing every operation of the state. So when you look at the um, news articles from those times and also um, though not really mentioned in her biography, you see the pictures, especially in the London press from those times, you can see that she didn't rule alone. She had um, Emperor Menelik's other daughters with her because part of the uh, role of the emperor was to receive uh, um, the will of the people, the, you know, the things they had wrong in their communities, things that they needed settled. They, they, they had to hear the voice of the people. This was more than Empress Menon could do by herself. She picked a party to do this with her. I mean, come on on collaboration. This is the understood that we're going to have to delegate some of this for this to work. In 1936, and she tells Sylvia Pankers, his majesty was in daily contact with me. Yes. Him being in Wallow, right, was sending me information every day about the updates on the war. She yes. is fully clear when his majesty is at Machau and faces that obliterating ba battle where just about everyone around him falls. Yes. Information is sent regularly to Empress Men. Empress Men decides I'm not going to be quiet on this. 1936, she gives her second big speech that is, it, uh, she invites the world press she says, no longer am I going to trust BBC to uh, beam out my voice and CBS. I'm going to go through Moscow because they blocked me the first time, right? Mm -hmm. I'm going to go through Moscow. She, you see somebody extremely politically savvy here. Sending her voice through Moscow, it will get blocked. But she sent it a different route trying to get around Europeans, right? And she just decimates them. She calls them by name, England, France. What kind of nation are you? Call yourself friends of Ethiopia. Where is your loyalty? Hmm. Come to the aid of my nation while you still can. You say you stand for justice. You say you stand for liberty. I don't think that the word prophetic only means having the ability to see what will happen in the future. I also hold that being prophetic is the ability to interpret the present. And to say this power, what's up? Hi and to have the courage to say it. Hi and Liz. the press said that there was tears in her eyes. And I mean, this is a woman who has heard from her husband that my elite guard has fallen. My elite guard has fallen. The, 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 the men them that were with me have fallen. The majority of them have fallen. I'm en route back to Addis Ababa. We probably gonna have to leave. Hmm. She's heard that. And she comes out to fire them. She said, until they picked up their devilish tactics, like spraying us with this um, poisonous uh, liquid that makes mm. our skin bubble up. They were losing this war and they know it. And they took on things that violated the conventions of war. What we know to be the conventions of war has been in violation. Let's talk about, she said, the fact that you all put an arms embargo on us. Mm. Well, you were allowing them to arm up. Mm. And even despite that, we were winning. Hmm. Talk she said, about even it. if we lose, even if we lose, we deserve to win. 
We put everything out front. I just, I have not seen someone even now with the courage to speak to the world that way. Not your, like, you know, school district, not the U.S. <laughs> government, the world. Yes. The world. And even when they blocked her the very next day, they put her words in the paper. They put her words in the paper, you know. And so we see very, very um, courageous women. When they had to flee Ethiopia, and I'll say this and allow others to jump in. Um, when they had to flee Ethiopia, Malaku Bayan really records this. And he says, his majesty was extremely concerned about her majesty, saying, I must get back to Addis before the Italian party gets to Addis Ababa because they're going to try to take the empress as prize. Hmm. And, you know, they're, they're um, hot on foot to get to Addis first ahead of their enemies. And he gets there and he really feels like maybe we can reorganize. And his council is like, no, 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 shut it down. We got to get out of here. And they're on the train now you know, headed out to Djibouti, you know, to then take the next leg of the journey. Um, and Malaku Bayan says that as soon as the mountains of Ethiopia slipped out of view, his majesty uh, felt such a great despair. And he said it was really Empress Manon that night who spoke and prayed and chanted hmm. and brought up the king and put the crown back on his head saying, you left nothing behind you, right? You have not abdicated. You didn't run, leave your people. We are seeking another way out. Speak, and he, he said she picked up the whole party because mm -hmm. people were hurt in their heart to know that you've been crowned king of kings and now you have to decide to go. And I'm saying unbelievable yeah. strength. What his majesty says at the end of her life, she never lost faith not even in the darkest hour. I to mean, me, I mean, those words may sound light, but he watched her go through the storm. And he like looked in her eyes and checked if I might imagine out loud, like, is she weak? Is she falling apart? And she was firm for him. I, I love that. I just think it's the, an example that we need to mighty, follow. Mighty, mighty, mighty. Dr. Wellete. Yes, I. Yes, I give thanks for that. I was just going to say, and that's without the seven oils. <laughs> and the, the eyes know, you know, Katamawi, Girmawi, Haile Selassie the first is I and I father. So I'm taking nothing away from the symbolism, but that is without the seven oils. Imagine if the Empress had gotten the oils. <laughs> will cramp and paralyze okay <laughs> yes family so you see um we're going deep into the history i i i you know this is this is a this is a a a, a beautiful manifestation for this platform and i think for the rastafari family um we're gonna do this every year um where we have this uh type of panel uh, to talk about our divine mother. Um, I want to um, uh, touch, um, Ira said asked earlier to touch on the divinity of Empress Menen. Um, can we just take some time uh, and go into the divinity um, of Empress Menen? Well, I'd like to, you know, begin from a very uh, basic understanding of, of, of that. Um, I think, first of all, we need to rework our definition of divinity. Um, just because we changed the, the, I, the D to an I and call it I-vanity, I, -vanity. I think that we're still dealing with divinity based on uh, a Eurocentric um, ideology, okay, or notion. So I think that's the first thing. And, and you know, and if we look at Ivanity from, you know, an African perspective, you know, Ivine beings also had human forms. I, Ivine beings also had human ways and mannerisms. That's what made them so attractive. You know, some people say that man has created God. You understand that, you know, African people, they create beings or, or Ivan beings that represent and reflect who they are, you know, so they're always in sync with one another. 
So I think that, so when you look at it from that perspective and you realize that we're not talking about somebody who floats on air, we're not talking about somebody who's um, in multiple spaces at one time. We're just not talking about that, right? We're not talking about that for Empress Minute. Neither are we talking about that for Katamari Haile Selassie either, okay? So that being said, Empress Menon's identity comes from her righteousness, you understand? Comes from her, um, her perfection, you understand? All of these things that um, Haile Selassie I he tells you why she's Ivy. She doesn't possess malice, you understand? um she uh she she is when when he says that she's um as faithful to me as sarah um i always the, the jazz match i and the i have reasoned about this idea of, of what that means obedient uh to me uh, and when we look at the story of sarah we see that she wasn't obedient in the typical sense of the word she was a protector honestly because she protected her husband from being um slave when Pharaoh desired her. So what she did was she lied for her husband in order to save his life. So if, if that is what obedient means, then that means you're simply a protector, you know? So, I mean, this whole idea of um, seeing her as, uh, like I said, this type of ethereal being that, you know, doesn't possess a physical form and all of these things that, you know, Babylon has told us, I think are misnomers. And I think until we start to look at identity through an African centered lens, then we will always have trouble identifying her identity. And also I think that when we consider Ivine um, sources that we again have to go and we have to look at ancient Kush. We cannot look at her as uh, through a Christian lens, we're not going to find the lioness of Judah um, in there. We're going to find only the lion. We're not going to find anything about her in Revelation chapter 5. So if we're trying to measure her identity against that of his majesty. It's not going to work because the Rastafari liberty never included her as Ivine in the beginning in the first place. So they didn't find any biblical justification for her identity. I and I, as her children, have to go back to the source. Empress Menon's identity or the search for it will require that you know African history or her story in order to be able to validate it. Give thanks, give thanks. And we have 39 people. That's a new record for the live. Um, the sister and them are bringing out the family. Um, if you're not subscribed to the platform, make sure you subscribe. We are building Rastafari independent media. We are not a footnote over here. We are talking about what we want to talk about. If we want to talk about Empress Men in a couple hours, we do that. Um, that is what we do on Rastafari independent media. We give thanks for everyone tuning in live and the hundreds that will tune in uh, to the replay. Um, we're talking about the divinity, our divinity of Empress Menon. Um, the floor is open. Any other sounds? Um, I, I was just going to block, you know, that was a very pertinent sound that Rasses blocked because the other part of it is that the sound that she blocked many years ago, and there is no Ja without a Ja S, mm -hmm. right? There's no God without a goddess. No priest without a priestess, no prophet without a prophetess. I always say there is nothing that I can think of in iration that is not balanced. There is everything balanced in iration. If we look at the flowers, the trees, everything, there is a male and a female or a balance. Uh, it's not different for Rastafari. This is, you know, this is the moment in I and I's liberty that I have termed the reckoning. This is the reckoning. When I and I walk through the doors of Ites, Gold, and Green, and I and I hail Katamawi as the highest high, as I and I father 
of iration, and I bow down and give all the glory. But as I and I irids evolve, see the earth is evolving and coming forward to its ancient glory. It's circular and it moves, it spins on its axis and it comes full circle. And I and I, the Rastafari, are at the gates of the reckoning. That's that's another interview, the jazz match. Yeah, man. Yeah. Um, the I do, you're due, you know, um, for an interview. So we're we're gonna definitely and um it's almost 10 o'clock. These are hard working sisters, they all work, um, so I cannot keep them for extended time. So we're gonna be wrapping up. Um if you have any questions, I want to open up the, the comment section. If there are any questions, we'll do another 10 minutes. Um, but again, these, these sister and them have to wake up early. They have things. It's a Thursday. I'm very respectful. That's why I get the big guests that you see here. You see? Because I didn't know I... <laughs> Russ, Russ has to shake their head. I get the big guests because I respect their time, family. So um we're not going to keep them much longer um please if you have any questions put them if you're not subscribed to the platform subscribe to the platform uh tomorrow i am dropping a big 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 interview um from saint croix uh sister aisha who is the assistant commissioner in the department of agriculture myself and dr Alete, we had the opportunity to go to her office we interviewed her got her her story we have rastafari that are in government uh running budgets you know multi-million dollar budgets in agriculture and and servicing the the island of saint croix saint john and saint thomas so big up sister aisha um for all of the work she's doing that interview is going to drop tomorrow so make sure that you subscribe to the platform this whole month uh the whole month of march we had sistrin from uh, Queen Shelley, uh, Mama Fire, uh, uh, Empress Sharon. Um, we had uh, uh, Queen Yvonne Hope. We had so many powerful um, sisters for the month. And we're not going to stop um, hearing the lion's voice here. I'm committed uh, to continuing with the lion voice. So, um, okay, we have a question here. Um, and this is just, uh, as you see, we can't do everything uh, in such a short time. The two hours flew by. Okay, this is the great Queen Mother Moses, the most traveled uh, human being maybe on the planet. I can't even put her in Rastafari anymore. Dr. Alete, I and I know them done did no say the Empress of Zion power needed no anointing <laughs> because her power was in the restoration of the divinity of the matriarch coronation of oneness, male and female. Beautiful. And I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna bring a panel discussion because I want to have this discussion, you know, because I see its thing. But tonight we're just focusing on Empress Menin. Um, I want to know, you know, in the house dynamics, how we are going to balance two heads in every household that's the conversation that we're gonna have that's for another time um give thanks for such a powerful and passionate word sound from i sistrin um uh, africa first is imperial majesty Ayla Selassie the first empress menin itige the perfect balance give thanks john marcos naya bingi greetings family give thanks for the word sound empresses I and I in the Bahamas celebrating Empress Men in Earth Strong this Sunday, honoring Rastafari empresses who contributed Empress Men in works. And I think it's important for us to really highlight that this is um, an uprising that's happening with Rastafari all over the world. Um, I want to big up Empress Sharon, Empress Men in Rising. They did a big event in Trinidad. She sent me some pictures. I'm going to highlight some of that. Um, on, on um, I'm gonna highlight some of that on the Lion Voice this Saturday. Um, I have some images straight from Trinidad, from Empress Sharon. So um, Empress Menin is is getting her due, and I know it'll only increase. 
I'm going to give our sister the chance to give some final words sound. Uh, Ras Maisha, big up yourself. Speak on Empress Men and Other Husbands. We're going to have to stick a pin. We did touch on it earlier, but um, I have to seal the show. Um, we have had these sister in here for two hours, and I try to keep the show to two hours. Um, we, we're going to go a little bit over, but I want to, you know, if we open up that topic there, that, that is a topic that needs. But um, Dr. Walletti did touch on the husbands. So if you play the replay, you will see that we did touch on each of the husbands um, earlier. So I want to just give an opportunity um, today. What are the lessons that we can learn, you know, for the young sisters who are watching, for the brethren who are watching? Uh, what are the takeaways from Empress Menon that we can translate? I'm going to give each of the item and then also let people know how they can tap into you. Um, we have three authors here. They have books. Please, family, don't just type and you say you love them. Spend some money with these authors buy their books they have products they have each of them have their own ecosystems lalabella institute um check them out uh dr Walete, dr asante where they all have um websites they all have products and services let us circulate the rastafari dollar family and uh, uh and support our creators who are adding value to our lives um all right so Takeaways, final sounds, and how they can tap in um, to the item. The floor is open. Um, I would like to start to say that um, let's think about Empress Menon um, amongst the greats who walk this planet. I mean, I don't want her to... Um, ever again uh, amongst Rastafari people and others, Pan-Africanists, um, to be seen as someone who stands in the shadow of someone else. Um, I want to end by saying that um, at the end of her Earth Tribe, um, Emperor Haile Selassie donated money, the um, 5,000 pounds to the Nobel Prize Foundation in Empress Menon's name. With the first... Um, donation of money going to a Parisian, someone in Paris who opened the Parisian Institute of Ethiopian Studies. I believe that her other honor called the Itegi Menon Imperial um, Spouse um, Award uh, for Ethiopian Studies went to uh, Professor Leo Hansberry, the father of Black Studies in the United States. So, um, he definitely didn't see her as someone standing in the shadow. I don't know, and I will wait and stand to be corrected of another woman who has a Nobel Prize named after her. I don't know of any, you know? And so um, definitely if we just follow the emperor, we see this esteemed woman um, who in every way um, upheld my aunt. I'm not saying did she do anything wrong? People ask me that all the time. Who am I? I don't know. I, I am saying that did she uphold my aunt, truth, justice, righteousness in her lifetime? Well, that's enough. You know what I'm saying? And we nothing else needs to be added when we look at her legacy, truth, justice, righteousness, beauty. It's all there. So um, come on, there's a ground swell. Let us um, not be um, a, a community that is not part of recognizing this divine feminine. And if you want to reach me, meninchronicles.com um, or L and on meninchronicles.com, you can actually get an email to me. So yeah, I look forward to continuing this conversation here and elsewhere. You know what I'm saying? We can't spend enough time speaking about the Empress. Give thanks for this opportunity being able to present with the other panelists it's really been a blessing give thanks uh, and we're going to be reaching out to the eyes so you can tell your own story you know these two powerful uh matriarchs here have all have already had their lion talk interviews but we haven't heard from the eye so the eye will definitely get a call so that we can feature the eye and the powerful works that the eye is doing uh in chicago so give thanks for 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 coming forward um uh, Dr. Walete, um, yeah, I can block. Yes, I. Yes, I. These are uh, these are very exciting times. 
Um, it's, you know, it's a long time coming, this glory, you know, Empress Menin being placed. Okay, okay. Placed on high, you know, giving her 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 uh, her just due. Give her her due. She's getting her due. Um, I'm thankful for the works that everyone is doing around highlighting the Empress and really walking in her perfect example. Um, I can be reached through email. Love Fire. L O V E F Y A H at yahoo.com. And my three works are Guragi, 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 the story of a Willow princess, Yeshimabet Ali Abba Jifar. And this is the work on His Majesty's mother. Also, charting the matriarchal shift in the Rastafari movement. And my soon-to-be-published third work, Rastafari Women as Living Sanctuaries. So drop an email to I, and um, I'm pretty responsive to email, and the eyes can get access to the works through there. I'm also on the IDOR study group every other setup. I believe I and I are meeting this setup, the IDOR study group, where I and I read the words of His Imperial Majesty, read from the selected speeches, and I and I are currently reading in African Affairs. So give thanks, give thanks for the opportunity. It was a mighty uh, presentation to my sisters that seat up with I and I. Give thanks. Give That's thanks so to the I, Dr. Wolete. Um, she is a member of the Lion Pride on Patreon as well. And as I say, one of I and I greatest supporters. So I, I definitely always have to salute um, the kindness, you know, um, and also my travel partner too you know we, we we do road and 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 go to different um functions and 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 things so definitely uh give thanks uh uh dr walete uh dr mm -hmm. rosses jazanai kush yes i um i would like to say to the audience to seek her majesty in the present you understand not to see her um as past tense, you understand, um, not to see her as um, even having transitioned, you understand, because I and I know, say, Karamawi Haile Selassie I lives forever, and so does his divine consort. So, because when you see her in that light, then you feel her, you, you, you are able to connect with her. And one of the ways that I and I connect with her every year is through the uh, Blue Fire I Treat named in her honor. And I want to say that for uh, there are several sisters who are in the chat who have um, been, been a part of that I Treat. If you want to feel Empress Menon's energy, right, and her synergy with her daughters, that that is one place to do that. Um, we all leave that I Treat feeling uh, mobilized, you know, feeling like we're ready, we're charged. Empress Menon provides I and I with a charge. And so I know a lot of times when ones are trying to overstand her identity and ones are trying to overstand how to connect with her, if you have not been taught how to do that, or if you don't feel that internally within yourself, then you might want to congregate with your sister and seat up in Jerusalem schoolroom where she is the focus, where her blue fire is the focus. So I encourage ones to reach out and to participate in that. And so I can be reached at lalabella.org at gmail.com, or, and that's my email address, or I can be reached at my website, which is lalabellainstitute.org and lalabellainstitute.com. Yes, sir. And give thanks. And I saved the eye for the, the final um, sign off because I also wanted that to just give a brief uh, little touch on how this year's um, I treat when I know you're just fresh. We can see the glow 
of the Iron Doctor were letting in, in the in the eye treat glow. So so how did this year um go? Any any highlights that I want to share? Oh, it, it was it was I was told um because you know I, I have the role of attendee and host, <laughs> you know, but from the the participants' perspective, they said it was the best one yet. You okay. understand? So that puts a lot of pressure <laughs> on I, you understand, to keep it up. But oh, it was absolutely phenomenal. Every year we have new sisters who come, you know, and I pride myself in making certain that those new sisters feel at home, that when they leave that three day I treat, that they feel as if they have sisters for life. And because this was the first year that the sisters crossed over into their ascension, it was wonderful to have those participants. Actually, they didn't witness the actual um, ascension process. That was done behind closed doors. But they were able to um, hail those sisters with their hyla title of Rosses once they emerge from their initiation. So it was very, very powerful. Um, and I just encourage, you know, I encourage my brethren who support it to keep supporting because while they can't attend the I treat, they can sponsor sisters. You know, they we had scholarships. Um, thankfully, we had several sisters who, based on the donations of brethren, were able to have scholarships to attend the I treat. You know, give thanks, give thanks, mm -hmm. and um, again, we'll give thanks for all of the powerful works that all of our sisters them are doing. We give thanks at the Queen of Kings. Um, uh, to use the, the terminology, and, and Dr. Um, James Small also speaks about, um, you know, how that uh, the woman king title was used on the continent, um, and, and what it what it speaks of. So, um, you know, I learned a lot. I feel you know my cup is full this evening, and I hope that everyone watching, if you're new, I hope that you subscribe to the channel, and I hope that you now see the value of Rastafari having our own independent media, controlling our own narrative, you know, not just projecting uh, smoking big spliffs, run out upon a stage. Yes, we love that part too, and we can do that too, but there's so much more to Rastafari culture and Rastafari family. Um, this is what I fell in love with uh, or st stood in love with as a young university student coming into the, the movement was the reasonings, you know, a reasoning like this would go to the daylight sometime, you know, and we would go back and forth, we'd pull out books with this, with that, you know what I mean? And it'd get passionate, this, that. That's what I love and this is what we want to preserve as we move into this information age and as we try this repatriation, Iowa. Why? Because the time has come for the lions and the lionesses to tell our own story. And this is the lion's voice. Iliai. <laughs> I am Nana Faraika. The time has come for the lioness to tell her story from her viewpoint and tell the world who Queen Omega is. This is the lion's voice. The time has come for the lioness to tell her own story. <laughs> well, lion voice, tell them that's the people first choice. Lion voice, when the lion has them feel nice. Lion voice, the lion cubs we sacrifice lion vice got to show the people them the lion vice lion vice well i live still say the first of the almighty and this is the chance match quasi and the mission that's the restoration of the black family yeah who ja bless me say no one curse Black woman, it's time to merge. Black redemption, we're on the verge. Well, well I don't care what you heard. Highly Selassie first, him no second or third. Cause even when their lines are blurred, the eyes stand straight, no bend, no curve. 
and him give you the love you deserve Him don't come fi dominate, him come fi serve Show us the way home, I live his words But I can do it alone, so black woman let's merge High tal, sip and herbs we merge Massage fi calm her nurse we merge Together all demon purge we merge Another family emerge we merge We spoke and no speech was slurred we merge we agreed that Babylon's absurd we merge we had pain no we feel cured we merge heal the king no she conquered well I don't care what you heard Haile Selassie first him no second or third cause even when their lines are blurred the 